My name is Andres Hake. I'm the director of the AAD program, the Advanced Architectural Design program here in uh, GSAP, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Uh, David Benjamin, Siad Hamad al and myself have been organizing this uh, series of summits on climate change at the building scale. Uh, this is something that is uh, uh, becoming something very important for the world. It's, it's very important for uh, the planet. It's very important for GSAP, therefore. Uh, we've been, uh, all the different programs have been looking at the way uh, architecture and architectural pra practices are climate. And uh, today we're discussing uh, the, the, the way climate change uh, it's, can be addressed, is affecting, is being addressed uh, to the building scale. Uh, this is something, of course, that is uh, reshaping not only uh, uh, architecture, but the planet itself. And it's something that poses questions that somehow also question the way we plan, uh, we practice architecture. Uh, the, in the last years, the discussion of climate change has been putting design, architectural design in the center in many different ways. And, uh, uh, and that's something that questions some of the traditions that we've inherited. Uh, and that are also posing urgent uh, questions to the way we can react to realities that are uh, 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 creating victims, changing our environments, and affecting the way we live. Uh, not only it's uh, climate change something that has to do with its origins, but also with the direct implications of it, the way uh, uh, water, it's uh, uh, the, the amount of fresh water and drinkable water in the world is, is, is shrinking. Uh, the reduction of the habitats and the diversity of habitats that is immediately having an effect on the reduction of biodiversity. Uh, the way uh, species are migrating and the economical and geopolitical uh, uh, questions that this is also opening. This is, for instance, the displacement of mackerel uh, from uh, northern Europe to, to Greenland. Uh, and directly producing a huge uh, uh, migra human migration that is uh, creating victims and which is producing inequality around the world. Uh, the question of uh, climate change is a question about our material world, it's a question about technology, it's a, que it's a question about our political institutions and all that it's uh, rearticulated through design. Uh, the case, for instance, of farmers in Bangladesh and the way that they're seeing their environment disappear, and that's directly prompted the migration of males to places like Dubai, where the uh, uh, star architects' uh, buildings are being built by people that are directly affected by this reality. It's only one case of the way architecture is being part of uh, hugely of uh, climate change in ways that are not directly uh, or that easy to characterize through a lineal uh, perspective. What we're seeing probably is the crisis of the modern times in which uh, resources were seen as something uh, uh, and like, like with no limits and where nature was something that could be seen from outside from a human perspective. The m way we perceive probably nature now it's very different there's no way to, to have a safe place from which nature can be seen from outside. And uh, that's something that is prompting reaction in every single aspect of our society, or in every single institution our society is made of. We have uh, a direct responsibility, of course, with many of the, of the policies and the, uh, and the, the ways they, they can be reinforced that are reacting to climate change globally. Uh, but also this is a conceptual uh, question for our practices. Design is being called to be situated, not to think of the general issues at large, but to really get to the details of how reality is produced. It's uh, becoming interescalar. What happens at the tiny scale of a glass uh, is having an impact in the world. It's transactional. Uh, there's no way to talk about uh, uh, climate change without talking of inequality and addressing it without addressing uh, its complexity at all these layers. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, it's uh, shown ineffective and acritical. And that's something that it's changing fundamentally the way also we think of our societies in regards to nature. The idea of give or pinch on that nature is kind of our fridge, uh, something that we have to care of because it's a source of resources uh, and that basically our relationship, humans relating to non-humans is through um, optimization 
uh, as a good result is being challenged by new notions of interspecies relationships that are, are uh, asking for humans to acknowledge the limits of our relationships with nature, and, and that's something that is already changing the way the curriculum and the design is happening in this building in GSAP, and it's a discussion that we care for. This is the second of, uh, of a series of two summits, and we call them summits given the fact that this is an urgent discussion that is re kind of constitution, refounding, relaunching our practices, and it's a, it's a process of relaunching uh, that uh, has to be done collectively, uh, putting together many different voices, many different approaches, trying to avoid, uh, to exclude any potential source of reaction. And that's something that is happening, uh, it happened in the first uh, uh, summit that I totally encourage you to, for those that didn't follow, to see it in, the, in our in GSAP uh, uh, website, in the, in the recording that was done at that time. It was also an opportunity to test uh, ways to reduce the, the carbon footprint of uh, summits by having a number of people not traveling, and that was a great effort for the, for the whole team, but it worked very successfully. And today we have this second summit. Uh, uh, GSAP has a huge compromise with gender equality. In the last uh, lectures and summits and symposiums that we've organized, uh, there was a, a great concern on a, n a natural way of, of kind of including gender diversity in the overall programs, uh, the presence of uh, all genders, uh, including transgender, intersexual uh, uh, people in the, in the programs has been uh, something very sensitive for the institution. Today we had a number of cancellations and you will see that uh, it's not the case, but it's very important for us to be very transparent on this. It's the result of a number of cancellations that happened in the last minute and that it's really not the, the way we work. However, uh, uh, we're going to have two sessions uh, two, two panels, uh, the first panel uh, uh, dealing with the materiality of uh, contemporary architectural practices in regards to climate change, the second one about the uh, uh, relation, uh, relational dimension of architectural practices and the way that they expand into scales and, inter, uh, and through interspecies relationships. Uh, David Benjamin is going to uh, continue. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Benjamin. I'm the director of Advanced Studios at GSAP. Uh, and I'm very happy to be organizing and presenting this event with Andres and, and Ziad today. Um, as Andres mentioned, this is the second in a series of events, um, but I also want to emphasize that this is, um, these events are both a required part of the advanced uh, studio sequence in the architecture program and also a public forum for exploring critical issues that are relevant to the world more broadly. Um, as Dean Amal Andreos has stated, uh, at GSAP, we could consider climate change to be ground zero for a shared discussion about architecture's engagement with the world. Uh, but of course, climate change is complex, and as uh, Andres was mentioning, it's intertwined with materials, technologies, economics, society, uh, politics, and culture. And although buildings account for a third of global waste, energy consumption, and carbon emissions, there is no easy architectural fix for climate change. Action on one register triggers uh, changes on other registers, sometimes in unintended ways with negative consequences. For example, the recent carbon tax in France, as you probably all know, uh, triggered the massive yellow vest protests um, and maybe we could say an environmental policy without social equity uh, ultimately backfired in this case. So climate change is a, a territory of science and numbers, but it's also a territory of culture and society. And from this perspective, I think it's important for us to look at the whole and the part at the same time, uh, to look at multiple scales in order to understand the impact and the magnitude of specific changes and design moves. In terms of numbers, uh, it continues to be startling to me that if all of the people in New York City became vegan, it would have a more positive environmental impact than if all the buildings in New York City were net zero. So this is not to say that architecture is irrelevant to the discussion, 
But it is to say that uh, while we might think about redesigning buildings and redesigning our approach to materials, we also might think more broadly about redesigning ways of life. So uh, to kick off the event, I wanted to offer two kind of provocations, two things that have been on my mind in relation to our topic here today of climate change at the building scale. And some of you may have heard me uh, talk about these before. Um, the first provocation is from Paola Antonelli, a curator at the Museum of Modern Art and also the curator of the current uh, Milan Triennial entitled Broken Nature. And as part of the exhibition overview, uh, Paola writes, even to those who believe that the human species is inevitably going to become extinct in the future, design presents the means to plan a more elegant ending. Um, and the second provocation is from political scientist Jody Dean. In an essay called The Anamorphic Politics of Climate Change, Jody Dean writes, just as class politics without ecology can support extractivism, so can ecology without class struggle continue the assault on working people. In other words, again, similar to what Andres was saying, it's just as urgent to address social equality as it is to address carbon emissions and environment. And really the two must, must be addressed together. So these two provocations are partly to say that uh, Climate change at the building scale involves design, and climate change at the building scale is complex with interconnections across scales, materials, society, technologies, and culture. In our first event earlier this semester, again, as Andres mentioned, we explored um, some themes including growing and reusing materials, uh, timber and CLT as a carbon sequestering material, um, and a kind of global and relational scale of action and ecosystems. In this event, we will explore topics including uh, stone, rammed earth, and local materials, as well as what we could call uh, the human-made natural. This is meant to be a working session. It's meant to raise questions more than to provide answers. And ultimately, it's meant to be part of a feedback loop with the school and with student projects that are currently, at this very moment, works in progress and open to influence. Our first panel will include three presentations. And the first presenter is Rafer Wallace from AOO. Uh, he is an architect and the founder of both AOO Architecture and GIGA. Uh, with a research focus on health and sustainability, AOO created GIGA in 2008, which is an independent third party that develops and administers both the RESET standard for healthy buildings and the Origin Data Hub. Working at the intersection of health, sustainability, buildings, and cloud technologies, Rafer is behind many award-winning firsts, including the first carbon neutral hotel in Asia, the first eco-regenerative retreat in China, and the largest modern rammed earth building in the world. He has co-authored books on modern rammed earth construction, as well as alternative chemicals assessment, and I'm very pleased to welcome from far away Rafer, thank you. Although I don't look at it, I'm Chinese. Um, that's kind of half a joke, but not really. Um, I'm originally French-Canadian, so just north of here, but I've been living in China for the past 17 years. Uh, and the, I've got 20 minutes, I'm timing myself. There's a, there's a saying, if you give an architect a mic, it's the worst thing in the world to do, they never shut up. Um, so I'm gonna try to, to not adhere to that rule uh, today. Um, and in order to contextualize this, uh, whenever I have the honor to be in a situation like this, speaking to students, um, it's encouraging people to, first and foremost, if there's one thing to take away, is to focus, make sure you zero in on what your own personal goal is, and make sure you realize that there's absolutely no right or wrong way to get there. Uh, and I've jumped across many topics. You're gonna get a glimpse of that uh, today. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best to try to synthesize it, but uh, I put this up here as a starting point. Uh, my favorite movie in the world, probably that has had the biggest influence in my life. I don't know, raise your hand if anyone is, is able to recognize this 
uh, yes, usually somebody Asian in the crowd. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, Miyazaki Hayao, uh, my favorite film director is Japanese. Um, the film is called Nausicaa, uh, Valley of the Wind. I saw it when I was seven years old, and it was the first movie to be picked up by uh, the United Nations as a must-see film. And it blew me away as a child. And for, I can bore you later on why, but it was pulled from the US and North American market, and I never saw it again until I was about 25 after having moved to China and rediscovered the movie. It's a story of a young woman living in a depleted world, our future, uh, and her plight to regenerate the world that uh, we live in. Um, <clears throat> this is her in her lab. And this set my definition of what an architecture studio should look like. So that, that was uh, the dream for, for what the, our, our future studio would look like. Um, but this set the mission for what I wanted to do later on. Basically here, to leave the world in a better state than when we found it. Otherwise, there's really no point in having been here at all. Um, and setting this as a personal mission, scalable solutions to environmental regeneration. <clears throat> now, that meant uh, I started my time on construction sites, working as a blacksmith, a timber, uh, a timber framer, a uh, bricklayer, uh, all of that fun stuff, and it's still honestly where I have the most fun. Um, and then I went into sciences, chemistry, biology, physics. Uh, it was kind of okay. Ended up with a, a Governor General medal from uh, Canada for uh, highest achievements, but it was phenomenally dull. Uh, and then finally made, it my, made my way to uh, architecture. <coughs> finally getting a chance to pull these pieces together. And in 2001, grabbed a one-way ticket and moved to Shanghai as the busiest place in the world, world just to get my hands dirty. And we were building uh, homes like this. I quickly zeroed in on very, very unapologetically people with a lot of money uh, because it allowed me to do research. And then when you do research, it trickles down. You need rich people to pay for research in order to make it available to the masses. <coughs> Uh, and that allowed us to do things like was mentioned, this is the first carbon neutral hotel uh, in Asia. And I'm not going to go through these projects in great detail, I don't have enough time. <clears throat> but one of the biggest challenges we hit was the problem of building materials. We were in Asia, uh, very proud of our designs as anybody with an ego would be. Um, but the building materials that we found were all garbage. So we're building designs that look good in the pictures but are actually built with garbage. Uh, you don't need to be able to read Chinese here. Um, right there, there's uh, PVC on the list. In 2004, when this was taken, PVC on a green building material list, you've got to be kidding. Uh, you, you, that's got to be quantifiable. <coughs> it wasn't. Um, so we started, I went back to my chemistry roots and started looking at the chemical makeup of products, right? So this is looking at something as boring as um, uh, varnish, wood varnish and the way it affects brain development, reproduction, so on and so forth. Um, and then we couldn't find any good materials. So this is in the early 2000s, we had to start developing a style, which everybody, I mean, this is super common today, that had no finished materials because we couldn't find any good finished materials. And we were working, remember, our clients were hyper wealthy because they allowed us to do this research and it would trickle down. So we had to propose this as luxury to uh, our clients. <clears throat> um, eventually started looking at rammed earth, uh, so this is, I don't know, can't remember when, but uh, you'll recognize the Hakka housing uh, in China. So we were looking at this as a solution for many reasons. Um, and uh, this is the traditional methodology of building these things here. And you know, a lot of people know these pictures, a lot of people has, have researched rammed earth before. This is the romantic view of rammed earth, but what you're seeing here is not a building, this is a cake. It's made out of brown sugar, it's made out of rice, uh, it's made out of straw. There's more organic material in that building than uh, in your average cookie. <clears throat> it's a slight exaggeration, but just to dramatize it, right? Um, it's a beautiful structure, but it's a highly organic structure. And the type of finish that we were getting there was not acceptable for the type of projects that we were after. So it was a nice romantic idea, but how do we actually make this scalable uh, and get to an impact? <clears throat> um, and this was, this was really interesting because in terms of local materials, we were looking at a lot of other local materials, such as building with straw, which in my book is an incredibly bad idea. Why? Because uh, I'll steal this uh, story from one of my mentors um, who uh, 
person I highly admire who uh, got this amazing, perfect client, try to keep this story short, perfect client, perfect project, wanting to build the most eco straw bale house out there, went to see his local organic farmer and said, I've got the most mind blowing, this is a one in a lifetime, we're gonna build this amazing house out of organic straw, we're gonna use your straw. And the, he was expecting the farmer to be super excited about this and the farmer goes, what the hell is it with you and with architects and this obsession at putting organic material into buildings? If I sell you my straw for your house, what the hell am I gonna use to refertilize my fields for next year? Like, can you please stop putting food in your buildings? And it really opened up this idea of, okay, what's the life cycle of the projects we're working on? If you are building a local house out of straw, make sure that it does not last longer than a year because that is the life cycle of straw. It should be a temporary house, right? If you're building with wood, that building has to last no longer than 70 to 300 years. That's the life cycle of the tree. That's how much time you take that tree out of the ecosystem and lock up the nutrients in something as dumb as a building, right? So if we're building for the long term, this is where you need to be looking at, at, at um, the materials that have the same sort of life scale as your building. Um, and this took us back to, to rammed earth, which obviously, you know, if we're building a, a building for, for a long time, then uh, from an earth perspective, we had several hundred years, several hundred of years to play with. Um, but here's, a, here's a, a picture of a rammed earth wall, which is a bit of a Frankenstein material. It's rammed earth mixed with straw. The organic material fails first, bugs go in to eat it. And again, just we were starting to realize there was a hot, big difference between idea and reality, um, especially when working with local materials. Uh, <clears throat> and that we needed to achieve uh, you know, basic things like comfort and so on and so forth. And uh, when, when I'm jumping around all over the place, but when we were looking at rammed earth way back then, we're realizing, okay, the thickness of a rammed earth wall has nothing to do with the structure and the load it needs to carry. The thickness of the wall has everything to do with the amount of energy that wall needs to absorb in order to re-release at night, right? So if you have high temperature swings, uh, really hot uh, in the day and really cold at night, you need a wall of, a, of just the right thickness to absorb the heat during the day and then re-release it at night. So it's perfectly cool in the morning, ready to store more energy and really warm at night. So the thickness of those traditional walls had nothing to do with, uh, with um, the structure they were holding, but with the energy they were holding. And when we were looking at the Chinese structures, we were realizing these bloody walls are 1.5 meters thick because they need to last a couple months through the winter, right? I can't build a house in China these days with walls that are 1.5 meter thick. So we were looking at how do we reduce uh, the, the cross section of the wall. To do that, I need to start adding a blanket, in this case, uh, insulation. And then we needed to transform to really take this to scale, not be a romantic idea. We needed to take what was an art and make it science. Uh, as an engineer, as a, as a science-based uh, uh, person, um, I needed the results to be predictable, meaning I can calculate exactly how my rammed earth wall is going to perform, and I need to be replicable. Otherwise, how do I get it through code? How do I get to actually build this without, uh, without creating liabilities and you know, getting through the reality of, of everyday practice? <clears throat> Back then, there were some really cool uh, Australian architects who were doing three-story structures with a pretty good finish, but it was uninsulated. So this was, not, this was good for a country like uh, Australia. It was not good for what we were trying to do in China at the time. And the idea came up with, uh, the idea was really just how could we leverage the benefits of, uh, of rammed earth um, and uh, reduce the cross section of the wall with a plane of insulation in the middle. Um, and fortunately, I was lucky enough to stumble across these guys in Canada, um, the most advanced group in the world doing modern rammed earth construction. They saved me 15 years of work. So if ever there's anyone you can copy, find them and zoom in on them. Uh, this became uh, my mentor, world's best teacher. <clears throat> uh, and 
it was doing exactly the type of work that, that uh, we wanted to be doing, um, turning art into science. Uh, this is the uh, Inkmeep Museum in the only desert in, uh, in Canada. Um, and what, what the numbers that rolled out of that, again, from an engineering and code perspective, in order to be able to do this at scale, uh, you know, you're seeing here the Great Wall of China, one megapascal in strength, uh, the first modern rammed earth walls, three megapascals, and what we're hitting today. We're hitting with rammed earth greater strengths than you hit with concrete, with half the amount of cement to a quarter of the amount of cement. As you know, the climate impact, the carbon footprint uh, is in the cement, so reduction of that is absolutely uh, critical. Able to hit those strengths while reducing the carbon footprint in half. And now as we continue to evolve the science on this, the goal is to be able to get this to such a level that we remove the cement, change it for other binders, such as, um, you know, you look at termite saliva, which has the ability to bind uh, um, sand. Now people starting to synthesize the termite saliva and use it as a, as a replacement for uh, cement, uh, geopolymers, and so on and so forth. So it's still very much a work in progress. Um, a little bit about uh, the, the difference between art and science, traditional rammed earth versus modern uh, rammed earth. Here, we're not, you know, what I was showing in China uses topsoil, a lot of organic material, great for the bugs, and then adds, as mentioned, brown sugar and other things that are sticky to hold it all together. In, tr in modern rammed earth, you aim for everything but the organic material. <clears throat> You're aiming for the inorganic material down below. Food in a building is bad. Um, so we're in these quarries. And then, uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details of this, but a lot of soil analysis, so geoengineering, uh, for particle size to, to really, basically what happens is, you know, we'll drop into geography and I'll, I'll ask people, uh, take me on a tour of the quarries in the area. Then we'll take samples of the quarries, do a cross-section of the soil, and engineer the most perfect uh, rammed earth wall in that area, saying I need a quarter of uh, of material from that quarry, uh, another quarter from over here, um, based on these uh, analyses. I work in Shanghai, in, well, in China, and I work in Sri Lanka also. So this is one of our sites in Sri Lanka that kind of just shows the process. I'm going to walk you through very, very quickly. Um, we don't use big wood bats anymore. We use uh, pneumatic tampers called butterfly uh, tampers. This is one of our clients in China who decided to take part in the ramming. You see the insulation plane in the middle. Um, and then when we're done, uh, this is a picture in Canada, um, we core out a piece of the wall and take it to a test lab in order to test the uh, strength. Um, this was our first project when I took this technology back to China and started training a local crew. Uh, you'll laugh in a moment, they were a brilliant local crew. So this is building uh, scaffolding for the rammed earth wall. And then as they strip it, um, the, uh, uh, the contractor is a massive fan of Corbu. And so he uh, surprised us by carving the modular into the formwork. And then uh, as you're carving the earth into the formwork and you remove the formwork, it stayed behind. So this was a, a great, uh, great little gift and surprise on his part. Um, the whole pavilion was designed on, on Corbu's uh, um, modular uh, proportions. Um, uh, details here, I, can't, I don't have time for today. Uh, that was the little, and then he turned it into a great contractor, best contractor in the world. Um, here you see the plane of insulation in the middle, and, and maybe here I'll pause because I am jumping around. What we were looking for in modern rammed earth was <clears throat> the ability to remove all finished materials. At the time I mentioned we couldn't, we couldn't find the right type of materials that, that uh, were non-toxic. And so what we loved about this rammed earth, this modern rammed earth approach is that paints, plasters, all that stuff indoors, gone. Uh, the finishes that you'd put on the outdoor of a building, gone. <clears throat> so we Im immediately eliminated 20 materials from a normal uh, construction project. Um, we end up with a, a really significant amount of thermal mass inside. So if you properly design the building to be passive solar, it sucks in the uh, energy during the day, stores it in the walls, and re-releases it uh, at night. 
Uh, we have a lot of case studies, ask me about that uh, later on. But we were looking at, one, the carbon footprints and, of course, climate impact of construction by removing cement uh, at large scale from these buildings. And then, of course, the operational impact of running buildings at a fraction of the uh, energy cost due to the uh, thermal capacity of these buildings. Um, again, coming into China, we had to do a lot of practice, so we built, uh, we built a bunch of fun projects. This is a, this is a winery. Um, and the other advantage of rammed earth is the ability to, to mitigate humidity. So it sucks in humidity and re-releases it. Perfect for wine, if you're a wine fan. Um, weaving it into whatever project we could, this was the uh, Vidal Sassoon Academy, and we didn't give them the choice. We said, you have to build a rammed earth wall. They said, okay. Um, this, we didn't design this, uh, we were just asked to build it. Um, this was the first three-story insulated building in the world. Very difficult project, crazy. Uh, this was a, a little uh, sample pavilion that we were testing a bunch of new ideas on. Um, and then playing with things like uh, circular walls um, that are also retaining walls to build these amazing little uh, villas, or not villas, it's a resort. <clears throat> um, and then this is some of, these are some of our Sri Lankan projects. They're, these are built, they look traditional because they're built on a UNESCO uh, protected site. So we have some, um, some requirements that we need to adhere to. Again, the rammed earth there. Um, and this is a rendering, I'm cheating. Uh, this is the actual building. So this was uh, designed by a friend uh, that we helped uh, build, the largest rammed earth uh, structure in the world, um, built in, in China. <clears throat> This is on the boards. Um, and the closest rammed earth builder uh, in your geography is in Quebec. Um, so this is, uh, this is the getting some really nice finishes uh, here. So again, I'm just pointing this out because this is in a climate that goes down to minus 40 uh, in the winter. Um, OK. Now, here's looking a little bit, just in the last couple minutes, looking at the performance. Uh, I'm a bit of a data geek, um, so looking at uh, sort of real-time data on performance of buildings has become an, an obsession over the years, as well as the uh, ingredient and chemical makeup of, uh, of um, materials. So here was just comparing typical wood assemb assemblies with, with uh, what we were doing with rammed earth. Of course, benefits of chopping out a lot of materials. <clears throat> and I just want to wrap up with what it is I do today. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, what it, uh, long and short of it, I've gone from starting as a blacksmith and a, um, a bricklayer and a timber framer to science, to going into uh, architecture, still having that practice, it still operates, um, to, I forget, uh, construction, and now I run a software company. <clears throat> um, what I realized is one of the problems we decided to tackle, it was the biggest problem that we were up against, was building materials for everything. Data on building materials was crippling us uh, from a health and liability point of view, chemicals in products that create a 10 to 150,000 year legacy. When we make a, a choice on a material and it's a toxic material, the amount of time it takes to break down and how many people it's going to impact um, over its lifetime. And then information on things like carbon footprinting, uh, life cycle impact of products from uh, water and uh, <clears throat> um, uh, biodiversity and so on and so forth. And so we were finding all this information in a whole bunch of databases around the world, which is, a, for anybody who practices, knows this is an absolute nightmare. As an architect, you need to find information on products that split um, in a ton of uh, places. So we came up with the idea that, you know what we really need is sort of a UN of data that just aggregates all data on building products and makes it universally accessible, where um, we have no paywall. Let's, let's make this data free. Let's, uh, let's use it to uh, promote transparency. Um, let's make sure that the data is up to date. And let's make sure it's neutral. <clears throat> uh, and so this was the big, this, this was the big vision. Um, it led to what is today the world's largest hub of data, what I spend all of my time on uh, these days. 
Um, and I'm missing a slide here, but uh, in it, um, if you go and have a look, it's all publicly, uh, publicly open. Look at mindful materials. We can talk about that later. Um, there's information on, we strip out the information on uh, embodied impact of materials. And then finally, um, the reset standard, which is currently the world's only standard that tracks the performance of building in real time. Uh, we do this via sensors, collect all the data into the cloud, and assess the health impact of buildings uh, on a daily basis. <clears throat> I put these in because we're in New York, so a very famous New York developer that we do a lot of work with, uh, another very famous New York-based uh, uh, institution. This is Tsinghua University uh, in Beijing. Um, and so that's it. I put a few social media handles up there if you're interested in, in learning more. So that was... Uh, time is up, but uh, that was a little all over the place, trying to take uh, essentially 20 years and wrap it up in 20 minutes um, on some of the touch points and some of the things we've worked on over the years. Uh, and you see a circuitous uh, course in order to, to try to get to uh, reach the goal um, that we started off uh, at the beginning. Thank you very much. Our next speaker on this panel is Francisco Adeo de Fonseca from Scree. Um, Scree is an independent firm of architects, engineers, artists, and technical specialists offering a broad range of professional services for the built environment. Scree started their practice by conducting a survey on the qualities of Portuguese raw materials in 2009, 10 years ago. Uh, by experimenting with clay and construction instruments, they managed to develop new materials and began to participate in the administration of building sites. They became the architects of experimental constructions where building techniques and craftsmanship were combined with refined engineering skills for sophisticated clients. Their architectural practice is based on establishing close links between design and construction, an approach that shows how materials can incorporate knowledge and how such knowledge can be instrumental in recreating architectural practice. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Francisco. Thank you for the invitation to, um, to the opportunity to share Scray's work with you. Um, as uh, David said, we started nine year, uh, 10 years ago, uh, right after the, the crisis. I mean, when the crisis started, the 2008 crisis, um, and there was no architecture uh, uh, market. I mean, all architects in Portugal were um, were um, immigrating and going uh, somewhere else. And uh, so, um, uh, me and my partner Pedro Gervel, we, um, for some reason, which I can't quite tell now, we started uh, going uh, traveling throughout our region and collecting um, Portuguese soils. And we collected hundreds of these samples. Uh, we wanted to, that's what I, that's my reading now. Um, we wanted to get sort of embedded into the, teriori, into the territory. Um, so um, from collecting soils, um, we started to also uh, test them to see how we could relate to those, what, what they could give us in terms, of, uh, in terms of materiality, not so much in terms of building construction. Um, and so we went through this, you know, one year, two years course of understanding what the logics of um, of the north of Portugal is in in, in the whole region, and um, and and we got a few commissions, not as uh, architects, but as uh, subcontractors. Um, this is uh, one of our uh, first jobs together, where we um, where we applied. Um, um, a raw earth as a plaster in a bathroom. Uh, that was uh, that was an interesting job. We uh, then we also go on collecting uh, local um, uh, bricks and uh, construction materials, uh, from which we now you know this is a this is a, a small construction, not a big one. This is a model what you <laughs> usually would see as a model, um, and. Um, and, and started to get into the course of, uh, of, 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 of compacting earth for, uh, for, for the purpose of building construction. This is a, a rammed earth floor, basically. 
that we, we started, and we were checking the traditional recipe books uh, in Portugal. We were collecting these recipes and seeing how could we sort of adapt them to, uh, to the uh, contemporary use. And usually, it's not really a technological question, okay? It's a question that goes a lot about uh, labor and, um, and, and, and the perception, the market perception about clay or earth. Uh, people would ask, like, eh, does it have worms? And do plants grow in it? And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural process. Uh, then we, you know, we started pressing this rammed earth uh, flooring solutions into tiles so we could use them more extensively and uh, making our own machines for it, usually pretty low-tech machines, but we, we always come you know, across this question, is like, who's, you know, how can we do it? You know, it's such a simple thing, but apparently the, there's not much offer in terms of uh, s specific machinery for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of work. So um, we made our press, hydraulic presses, and finally, I mean, after, after a few years of struggling, we got our first building entirely uh, refurbished out of earth. So the, the project, the, the building uh, started with the 14 uh, big bags of, uh, of, of earth, and we used it for flooring, for walls, for ceilings, for bathrooms, for everything. I mean, we, uh, uh, as you can see here, I mean, this is a kind of another rammed earth technique where you ba basically compress the, the earth into a, into a mold and you make bricks uh, we call it the CEB bricks. Uh, it's a very common uh, solution, but um, in Portugal we seismic region. We highly seismic, so we we have to revise how to build with these materials um, against the seismic regulation, basically. So that's a big challenge. Uh, but uh, again, it's not a truly a technological challenge. It's uh, maybe a reading challenge. Um, and so we started make. We made the first um, um, a CB building in Portugal, in the north of Portugal, in the north, with, where you have no clay, basically. It's, it's just granite, which is a difficult um, uh, sand to work with. This, this, these blocks are really, really nice to build with because they have no, no, um, 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 they have no, uh, how do you call that, render, mortar in between the bricks. So the mortar goes inside, like a Lego. It's really nice. And um, I just added this kind of slide so you can see that um, our modeling, I mean, the, the models we make are focused uh, um, uh, on construction. So we anticipate the construction process with uh, models. We extensively model with bricks. We produce our bricks. We produce the roof tiles. And that really gives a sense. We usually have like architects to direct the building site and uh, not engineers. Um, I mean, uh, we, we try to push architects to lead the building site. And, um, and models are very, these kind of models are, models are really important to achieve that because then you get the sense of how much material you have to handle. You know, you have the sense of the logistics and all of that that is completely out of, a, of our traditional disciplinary approach to model making and architecture. We try to bring it in. Um, this is an anticipation of a, of a test for a catenary arch made with the CB blocks. And this is how, how, how we work. I mean, it's, again, it's not a technological question. It's a question of, 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 of doing and, and, and getting the process started. It's, it's mostly about that. And then in the way, you're going to solve the tech problems that come to you, like, <laughs> like Refer just showed. Um, um, and so we, we made a prototype. Um, let me get like this so I can also look at the slides. Yeah. Um, no. Um, this is my partner Pedro. He always takes the dangerous uh, roles. <laughs> We're loading an arch just to see. Oops, how it works. We did with this a couple of times to get a sense of of how these bricks would 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 uh, perform in terms of uh, of of of, uh, of arches. We've built a. One one prototypes, and this came at a time that we got a commission from a, from a big winemakers. We work for winemakers a lot uh, for making a, a hotel in the middle of nowhere, and where we plan to make uh, CEB arches. And so we also, you know, made, you know, produced models with several arches. And that's really really uh, pedagogical for ourselves to go through this kind of of, of small scale building work. 
this is a, well, this is just a picture I fit in because it's interesting to see how models can also work for you to map the 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 the, um, 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 the the earth and the territory and how it's made up. This is a model for for the hotel with different parts with a with a sun arch and the lunar arch. And by working with when you work with big teams and everybody needs to get a sense and to give an input in a short period of time, these models really are very very helpful. Um, but we ended up not doing the hotel, we did another building, which is this uh, winery. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a winery that where rammed earth, for instance, is placed in between these concrete pillars. It's um, literally, uh, at the moment, very difficult to go through the seismic regulation in, in, uh, in Portugal when it comes to building uh, rammed earth, 100% um, um, rammed earth buildings. And, um, and so we got this, um, this uh, building made by using spillers, which I don't have a picture to show to you, which has a bu butterfly shape. So it's, it's like this, you know. That's the section of the pillar. So basically the rammed earth is clicking into the pillar, and when the building shakes, you know, the pillars are holding the horizontal forces, but they're keeping the wall in place. Otherwise, the concrete would just burst the rammed earth building. When you mix rammed earth with other materials, it's very critical because it has its own seismic wave when the, when the wave goes through it. It has its own behavior and when you fit other things in it, it becomes kind of, kind of critical. So um, we made this, so what you see there is a number of detached walls basically. Um, this is the, the winery, this is the inside of it. You know, it's eight meters uh, rammed earth walls. But you know, the greatest achievement in this was that the, the, the subcontractor who made the uh, the building? Uh, he's now one of the greatest builders in Portugal in rammed earth building. By that time, we had no one who could price this building properly. So we made a a, a, a working session with with local men, local people. So they would, you know, w they they've built like a, a, a two meters long wall um, themselves, and then the building price dropped by half. And they they this was their first you know, significant job in, in, in rammed earth. And, and, and then the markets for them started to, to, um, to open up to rammed earth uh, solutions. And they're uh, like doing really, really well not right now. So when you look at this, I mean, don't, don't look at rammed earth itself. I mean, look at all the invisible um, uh, uh, reverberation it has across the economy, across the local economy, the, the labor, the environment, and that's, for me, I mean, for Scray, is the most impor important thing in architecture is precisely what you don't see. Um, so, and so, when you think of, of 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 getting the grains together in rammed earth, is exactly the same as, as stone construction. You have to grind it, you have to transport it, and you have to place it together. Uh, um, uh, it's the same logic. Just the grains are a little bigger, and um, so you could also, you know, eventually see this as a rammed earth wall, I mean, and start to relate, uh, make, start to, um, to understand that the grinding, I mean, the, the sourcing in nature, and then the transformation, and then the, the way you sort of settle things, put everything together again, it's, um, it's a natural process. It's something that is happening everywhere throughout, throughout um, uh, nature and throughout um, architecture. And perhaps we should um, we should start to look closer at this at this loop, let's say, of uh, of sourcing, transforming, and putting it back. Um, this is Pedro. We made uh, some vats in the ground so winemakers could produce their own wine into these big pits. You know? So we were my partner. He was he's just diving in one of these uh, huge <laughs> vats. Um, and that really reminds us the process of bees, you know, the way, you know, they, 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 they come to, to, to terms with the, with the pollinizing the whole, the whole, uh, the whole forest. It's, it's such an inspiring animal, the way we, we can learn so much from it. Um, and so we at Scray, we have um, our own, our own um, uh, uh, beehives, uh, so we can also, source ourselves from beeswax and propolis. Propolis is a kind of a beeswax 
that is uh, it's so incredible that it's it's been all sold to the pharmaceutical industry. You can't. It's super expensive, but uh, when you have your own beehives, you get propolis for free, you know, and and honey and all of these. Uh, and for us, it made a lot of sense to start making our own oils for wood and varnishes out of these components. And then, okay, I mean, the easy path is to get your own beehives and starting source yourselves directly from there. Um, and so, you know, we, we extensively use beeswax because, you know, that's that's what our bee friends supply us. We use it for making stained glass and in. Um, and also to use it in, in plasters with incredible results. It's really nice to see how such a simple material, when you add it to plasters, it will make them so resistant, so you know, anti-fungical. It's, it's really nice. Um, this is a restaurant uh, made with a, a plaster out of bee wax and the horse manure and, uh, and a clay plaster. Um, but there's another material which is really fascinating for us. It's, it's perhaps the, the one that that will, s you know, it's, it's one that can break out of thin air, it makes sugar. Out of nothing, virtually, apparently nothing, using just light uh, as, a, as an instrument, it makes you kind of crystallize sugar. And, um, and that material is wood, uh, wood, is, uh, let's just say, a crystallized sugar made from nature, which fascinates us um, uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a material that it's always giving you back. You know, it's solving so many questions on the side and it's giving you so many, uh, um, so many capacities. This, this, this is wood we, we use from old uh, wine vats, so we recycle this, all this wood this a hundred and something years old wood. The wood, you, you know, we've, we've traveled to France to visit these forests and to meet the people who actually take care of, this, of the forest and who make the wine vets. And I mean, it's so respectful, it's so um, breathtaking. When you see those huge trees, I mean, an oak tree like this, you know, it takes you 180 years to grow. And so the wine vets, they're just, you know, uh, disposed like they were nothing at the end of the process, so we started to to reinsert them into the um, into specific jobs we made. Um, this is a, a winery again, and having our own trees. I mean, we now are very happy to have um, uh, our own trees, and we usually go for the invasive species because uh, we have a tree called Australia. There is a acacia, and it's really taking the whole. Um, it's everywhere now, it's a plague, you know, people can't, we can't, we don't know how to handle it anymore. And so um, people just keep on chopping these trees, they grow really fast. Um, and what we tell people is like, no, just, just leave it, we're going to use it. We're going to use it for our own building works. And then we replace, uh, as we use them, we, we, we offset them with, uh, with, um, with nat native trees. Um, it's, a, it's, um, it's a process which... You know, I can't, I don't see why it's not embedded everywhere. It's so simple that you can, you know, just offset wood. It's simple, it's really joyful. I mean, it's great to go and plant trees. We, um, so our relation with wood goes all the way from, from, uh, from reusing uh, wine, um, wine uh, barrels to, um, to having our own trees for construction and, um, and and the passion goes it's not really about wood it's about cellulose it's about cellulose it's about also the way that you can use certain plants to rejuvenate the territory we're desertifying portugal has no uh, national source trees anymore we don't have i mean the trees we have are pine trees that are like it's kind of almost a, a pedophile relation with uh, with uh, with trees it's crazy. I mean, it's been all taken by eucalyptus for paper making. And the construction sector is so huge. It's so huge and impacting. It, it, it has the possibility to reverse this just by starting to, starting to think beforehand, before you take the design pen, just think which industry, which uh, craftsman you're going to give a hand to. That's the power of, 
architects. I mean, that's part of it, but it's a significant part of the power we have. So um, we decided to, um, to introduce uh, hemp lime construction in Portugal, uh, being a decent model. Of, uh, before we start working with it, we were like, okay, how to, well, how to, how are we gonna handle it? What does it mean in a building site? We made a one-to-one -one prototypes. Um, we also prototype in our own office with these kind of mock-ups, <laughs> just trying to <laughs> to see how it works. And the clients are really sort of, you know, what's coming. You know, it's uh, very, very uh, not easy to handle. And then um, we started making our own bricks, our own bricks, um, making the mix. The machines you you need to pass them, um, and we started off our own production of hempcrete blocks, which is of this kind is uh, quite pioneering in Portugal, uh, especially because we try to normalize the materials, also to go through the to the process of uh, of making it available to others, um, and so we're in the way of getting the first such building in Portugal made um, in different sort of. Uh, trials, we get materials to work in different ways, uh, hempcrete, which is basically the only building material I know which complies with the major regulations, which is thermal regulation, fire regulation, and acoustics in one material. So that's quite sophisticated. When you mix uh, hemp, uh, hemp uh, stalks, like small, uh, I don't know how to call it, holes, whatever, and then with lime, it becomes quite a high-tech solution which you can apply across your projects. Well, I'm heading towards the end of my presentation. This is the slide I, I placed for me to, <laughs> to, um, to warn me that um, we're heading towards the end. And um, and the passion for 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 um, for cellulose and uh, vegetable fibers uh, goes uh, way beyond um, uh, what plants can give to us. Animals. There are animals who also produce cellulose, and we're starting to tap into it. Um, most of you probably made kombucha, this simple drink, um, you get um, uh, uh, kind of a tea, and you have bacteria and funguses who actually work together in very complex ways and gives you, um, and, and, and give you um, this, which then you turn into this, and you turn into this, which is basically um, kind of a bio-leather, people call it, but we think you can go really far with this kind of solutions. We're starting to, to, to be able to make it waterproof and we think, um, we think um, in a future to come that uh, we'll be able to replace uh, asphalt, um, uh, asphalt, um, um, uh, how do you call that? Um, I forgot the word, um, with this. Um, asphalt filters, you call them. Um, the important thing here at the end, just to wrap it up really fast, it's not really a question of sourcing. It's a question of a sy synergetic working. You don't give anything, you, you, you don't source anything, you have to give in order to get back. You know, it's about this sort of loop. And this is very visible with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this kind of uh, 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 animal cellulose, that you just, you just make a soup and the bacteria will take it over and it will produce this bio leather for you. So it's nothing to do with sourcing. That's an old thinking, you know? You have to think, you have to give something, you'll get something back. And this, by fitting this loop, you know, you'll be able to perhaps see the huge impact architecture and building construction has in the environment. This is our um, uh, arts division. Um, we've been involved with uh, some workshop teaching and this is um, this is our environmental action group, um, which basically, you know, um, I would see this as a kind of a, one of those pools of uh, animal cellulose, very complex pools where you just have to make sure that um, that the environment is set so that you know bacteria can start to work. The same holds for us. We uh, need to get the right um, environment, the right setting for us to take off and start to, start to, uh, to take action. Um, and um, yeah, okay, that's what I had to show to you. Thank you. Great, well thank you. I just, I can't help mentioning that that, uh, 
that last material is compatible with some research here, here at the school. In fact, um, a, a student project from about a year ago made with bacterial cellulose won this uh, school's, well, the Buell Center's inaugural Paris Prize, which aims to award architecture by students at the school that is kind of living up to the ideals of the Paris Accord. Um, although I should note that there were several complaints from other students in the studio about the smell of that material. So smell is the topic of another symposium. Um, our next speaker is Elias Anastas uh, from AAU Anastas. Elias studied architecture in Paris and set up an office there before winning a competition to build a music conservatory in Bethlehem. He returned to Palestine in 2010 and has since expanded into furniture design and research projects that celebrate local artisanal skills. He is a partner at AAU Anastas and also co-founder of Local Industries, a community of artisans and designers dedicated to industrial furniture making. His most recent work includes While We Wait, an installation commissioned by the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. It is part of the AAU Anastas research project called Stone Matters, which combines traditional building craftsmanship and materials with innovative construction techniques to produce architecture that is inscribed with both local heritage and natural surroundings. Please welcome Elias. Thank you. It's, uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I'll uh, just start very quickly by introducing our studio. We, uh, uh, our studio is actually sequenced into three different entities. Uh, a classical arch architecture studio where we do public buildings. This is a courthouse that we did in the north of Palestine. Uh, we have the, the network of production with local makers and artisans around the city, local industries, and a research department that deals with questions that spans from um, material to territory. Um, so before starting talking about specifically these projects about stone, um, we uh, started several months ago putting together sort of a list of notes on uh, architecture in the Middle East and elsewhere. And I'll just go through them, read them quickly. So this is a project that we did for a small educational campus in Ramallah. The concept was linked to the topography of the site and the essential space of campus that we designated as the common spaces. The very steep land combined with the will of focusing on common spaces led us to work on a hairpin-shaped building. The single unique building is accessible with a common space that snakes through the entire site with a smooth ramp. All interstitial spaces are planted and create in between island of freshness. When presented to the client, the project was immediately rejected because it was not a fundraising friendly project. The client could not raise funds for a project because philanthropists would ask for the name of, uh, for having their name on, a very, on, on each one of the specific buildings that would be allocated to their, to their funds. We realized here that actually funds are shaping architecture, that the economic system shapes the building, and the city is no longer planned by architects by, but by investors. The city belongs to real estate investors. In Palestine, buildings that were built before 1917 are protected. However, all modern architectural heritage is being disregarded as an architectural heritage and replaced by economically motivated commercial investments. As an architect in Palestine, we can experiment, build more easily than any, than any other part of the world thanks to the absence of framework. But these are the exact same reasons why an investor is able to destroy a heritage-fueled building and replace it with a commercial center. We, pay, we play by the same rules, yet we take the absence of framework as a tool in the process of making architecture. This testifies the bitterness of architecture and pinpoints that there are no ideal projects. The city is a violent environment, yet at the, at the essence of cultural enrichment. Perhaps bitterness creates a framework in which architecture is challenged. We were always impressed how crafts, ele uh, crafted elements of architecture combined at the building scale can have an impact on the built environment. Artisans have a role to play in the architectural landscape. Unfortunately, today, the, today most of the designers are interested in the illusion of saving the crafts and in a sort of nostalgic vision of art artisanal works. 
Interestingly enough, most of the designers aiming at saving artisans tend to work in countries on, of the global south. One could think that this makes sense since artisans are being, disregarding, are being disregarded in those regions, which is true. However, it's not only true in the global south, and the imperialist nostalgia that is used to pretend at saving crust is, most, is more of a self, selfish, useless approach to design. No artisans are to be saved, and even less by designers. However, celebrating artisanship is a whole different perspective. Celebrating crafts make use of contemporary skills and art of artisans for the production of design and architecture in a contemporary modern context. Crafting the city with artisans is such an enrichment of our knowledge of the city and its materials. al Abdiya competition is a fake brief with a fake for a fake uh, touristic project. In fact, the project's brief is uh, what Ronaldo Rosaldo would call imperialist nostalgia, with the small difference that the brief's writers are those same, same persons who have been colonized. Heritage, in particular architectural heritage, has become Western contemporary appreciation of local cultures. It freezes architecture in a state of musified objects, of illusional qualities, and de facto gives a folkloric value. How many times have we associated Arab architecture as if all our architecture are identical with uh, musharabiyas and domes. Global and local knowledge are usually opposed as two separate systems of integration with particular contexts. This church in France has been built after Saint Anne uh, Church in Jerusalem, yet Saint Anne was built by the Crusaders using local techniques of construction. Those two churches share very similar construction techniques. With that in mind, we can ask ourselves if the church in France has been built with techniques that Crusaders exported from Jerusalem. The architecture of Palestine combines disparate architectural elements brought by different civilizations from abroad with local elements found in situ. Through time, certain architectural attributes originally found locally returned to Palestine as imported architectural elements. In an attempt to blur the limits between local and global architecture, Stone matters put forward the relevance of research beyond space and time. At the V&A Museum in London, the cast room is made of one-to-one -one replicas of Italian Renaissance sculptures. They were, at the time, where traveling uh, was very costly, used to give access to a wider audience of co to contemporary art. The international expo events were set to share advances in different realms of countries in the world. In a world where technology allowed a high level of, of uh, far distance communications, what are these types of events made for? So Stone Matters is our project that uh, we started four years ago on uh, uh, the use of stone in contemporary architecture. In Palestine, we have um, a context where we have to use stone uh, up to 70% of, uh, of envelopes of building. Uh, it was historically used as a, as a structural thermal component and gradually with time, during the last 50 years, uh, its use has been disrupted and we're we using it more and more as a cladding of uh, concrete structures. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, small construction, this small shelter made out of stone is, um, is found throughout the landscapes of Palestine. Uh, historically, we didn't have any land registries and in order to mark properties, we used to lose, uh, use stone as uh, used to have, to have these uh, kind of structures punctu punctuate the landscape and uh, generate markers of property. So in that, uh, in that context, we uh, started uh, producing this research on uh, the use of stone as a, as a structural component in architecture. And um, th that was the first experimentation that was um, um, produced and conceived on a public space. And the idea that uh, the whole research was uh, an open source project, uh, and uh, all the algorithms, all the, detail, the details, uh, and the mechanisms of construction were given away on, 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 the, on, on the public space. Um, the project was as well inscribed in a logic where um, uh, referring actually to, to these uh, first kind of uh, stone castles that we used to find uh, throughout the landscape. And in, in our contemporary history, we are uh, trying to use them as uh, markers of property, but in a context where there are um, uh, different elements of the nature in Palestine that's, uh, that are being spoiled, 
because we have uh, historically a very important uh, heritage of landscape. And uh, due to the political very heavy context, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a tendency to go towards the conquest of territory. So the balance between the city centers and the landscape is being disrupted. So the, the structure was, uh, after its exhibition on the public space, was moved to uh, an area C. An area C in Palestine is an area that is uh, under Israeli military control, and no, construction, uh, are, no constructions are allowed. So part of the process of the project was uh, to think of uh, how we could uh, reposition these elements of architecture in the landscape in order to mark property in a politically charged context. So the structure was uh, displaced uh, uh, on a Friday night during the Shabbat because this, is, this area is not allowed, uh, we are not actually allowed to do any constructions or modification of the public space. Uh, this second project uh, is, uh, the format of the project is particular because it's a collaboration that we're doing with an artist residency that is allowing us actually to, um, um, uh, to, to actually build a research project. And uh, they, uh, the, the whole format of the project is that they're, uh, they're having uh, um, a program to have this project implemented in the city of uh, Jericho. And we wanted to have a possibility to uh, implement a specific uh, research project. I mean, the, uh, usually when you have a, a research project, you end up having it uh, you know, based on, uh, on documentation, and it, it won't have the possibility to be uh, built. So the whole idea was to create this um, format of project that would allow us to have our research built into uh, a long-term uh, uh, architectural project. So the first, um, is the whole project is based on the, the principles of stereotomy. This is uh, one of the door lintels that you can find in the old city of Bethlehem, and that show actually the complexity of the cuts of the stones and how the the cuts generate the stability and uh, create self st self standing structures. So the first prototype for this artist residency was a vault that spans over a distance of 12 meters, and the different uh, pieces of stones were cut in a way to generate this. Uh, this uh, autonomous uh, piece of vault. Uh, one of the complexities was to think about uh, the uh, formwork and how we can find a way to have a, a formwork that would be as precise as possible and that would allow to have the interfaces of the different stones to take the different uh, charges and uh, reactions. So the formwork was produced using uh, polystyrene blocks that were carved. And the whole, the whole idea as well was how we can couple the, know -how, the very rich know-how of uh, artisans and makers uh, with uh, novel techniques and uh, advanced uh, techniques of fabrication. This is the result. It's a vault that spans over a distance of 12 meters with a four meters high, uh, height in the middle. And it's, uh, it has 45 different typologies of stones. And they're they totally um, stand through the uh, stereotomy principles that were developed for the project. We're currently working on the second prototype of that project that's coming up soon. So while we wait is a project that was commissioned by the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and it was a project about the cultural claim over nature in Palestine. Uh, historically, the Palestinian city is built around uh, a duality, a duality between the very dense nucleus that you have in the historic centers and the landscapes. The most important element of uh, heritage in Palestine for us was the landscape. And today, uh, due to the fragmentation of the territory, there's a tendency to go towards the conquest of territory. We try to consume lands because from the moment where you consume lands, uh, expropriation becomes harder. So we are losing, uh, we are losing actually this uh, very important duality, uh, the urban duality that, that we had historically. So the project actually deals uh, with this, um, with this uh, urban form that we had historically. So this is, this is, this is an area that's called the Kremizan Valley, where historically it's one of the most important uh, na natural uh, uh, areas around the region of Bethlehem. And this is the city center where we can notice uh, a very important um, 
density that uh, is totally adapted to a specific uh, topography and to uh, that actually generates a, a form of architecture that is uh, suitable for uh, specific climates. So th the project was um, inscribed as well in a context where this whole area of the Kremizan Valley is uh, beyond the area C, so it's under uh, military control, Israeli military control, and it's, uh, it's currently threatened to be totally cut from the city. So this is the separation wall that uh, uh, made out, is made out of concrete and that creates uh, a road that connects Jerusalem to the settlements that are around Bethlehem. Um, and the local community around the, um, from, from this specific valley and the, the monks from the monastery that is located in the valley created a very interesting form of protest where they would gather in the valley every Friday and they would protest the passage of the wall. And gradually within, the time, within time it became a meditation exercise that gathered different parts of the community. So the project of um, While We Wait was as well a kind of uh, um, we wanted to memorialize these gatherings through a physical space that would be uh, positioned at the very specific spot where these gatherings are, are happening. So this is one of the first principles uh, that we tried to put together in order to generate a structure that is totally self-standing through the geometry of the stones and how uh, the stacking and the, the way that the lacing of the stones can uh, can uh, um, be economical in terms of use of material and at the same time can go towards uh, spaces and heights and volumes that are uh, quite, uh, qu quite big. So the whole carving and, and uh, the geometry is as well a reflection on the smoothness and the organic uh, shapes that are found throughout the valley. And it refers as well to these kinds of uh, stone shelters that we, that we localize uh, as markers of, uh, of, of property. So this is the structure that was developed. It has a height of five meters, uh, a footprint of eight, meters, of eight square meters. Uh, we have 300, 500 pieces of stones, uh, and they only stand through, the, through this particular shape that was uh, generated uh, that is based on the very specific stereotomy principle. That's part of the uh, show uh, at the Daylit Gallery in, in London. Then the project actually, one of the components as well of the project was to think about uh, a project that gets into a museum. So it was uh, an inverted path of uh, an object that uh, gets musified. So the project is born at the museum and then travels to another exhibition and then finally gets back to the valley, and it's uh, today serving the community as a, um, as a meditation space. <coughs> Another project that we completed last year is a flat vault, and it's part of, uh, it's located in a, in a monastery in Jerusalem. Uh, it serves as an extension of the gift shop of the monastery, and it's uh, a vault that is entirely made out of uh, pieces of stone uh, voussoirs that are assembled in a way that to generate a, uh, a self-standing, uh, totally flat slab of uh, eight meters by eight meters. And the principle is that the stones are woven together. So we, we, uh, we align the first line and then we put in steel P bars and gradually we insert the other pieces. So the structure is, um, the, the, the ceiling actually holds on a certain number of columns that are m massive stone elements. And uh, the ceiling uh, is um, made out of 350 pieces of stone. And that particular context, is what it was as well, to this, con this church actually is, uh, was uh, built during the Crusaders period and uh, the, in the um, crypt of the church was as well um, conceived in a very similar process where the stones are generating different kinds of geometries of spaces.
this project was part of the uh, Jerusalem show, and it was as well a reflection on uh, a, t a typology of a vault that is based on a rectangular plan, and it's part of a new collection that we are uh, trying to develop that's called Analogy. And uh, the, aim of analogy, uh, the aim of analogy is to generate um, a certain number of uh, architectural elements that are all made out of stone and that could uh, uh, regenerate the whole um, vocabulary of architecture, uh, coming back to crafted elements that, uh, that have an impact on the urban morphology. So going from the scale of an element of architecture and how we can have a, result, uh, a new result on, on the scale of the city. So these are the interfaces um, that are actually holding the entire structure. Oops. And this is uh, a project that we are developing currently. It was it got acquired by the Victoria and Albert Museum, and it's uh, it's a circular a circular lintel. Uh, that spans over a distance of two meters by two meters. Uh, and the cuts of the stones, uh, it, it actually sits on three points on the floor. And uh, in, in between these three uh, positions on the floor, the different geometries of the interfaces uh, have very specific curved elements that hold the entire structure together. This is one of the first prototype elements that, uh, that have been developed. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been really inspiring and amazing presentations. Uh, it's going to be hard to really uh, talk about all the uh, material that you have showed us because it's such a prolific, expansive kind of experimentation, fields of experimentation uh, with, you know, with concrete architectural outcomes. But maybe I would like to start with a few remarks and maybe we we'll turn it into a conversation <coughs> or a question. The first thing that strikes me, I think, from those three uh, presentations is really uh, maybe from an architectural history point of view, from a recent architectural point history, is that how far we have gone from the idea of looking at material in a fetishized manner, where the aesthetics and the light, the movement of the light across the surface, the texture uh, was kind of celebrated into perhaps uh, definitely a more radical way of understanding material that is, has to do with process, has to do with the uh, there's always an environmental awareness, but also there is a consciousness towards who's building the material, where is the material coming from, uh, how do we build it, how does it contribute to the economy, how to, does it contribute to the craftsmanship, but also how far we went from the idea of looking at material that is really tied to a locality and to a vernacular, and instead, uh, while keeping that history and knowledge in mind, like really pushing forward and experimenting with where this material can go, right? So the stone is a flat vault. It's not a vault anymore, it's a flat vault. So I think that's becoming, or the dimension of the round earth, moving, removing the, the organic out of it, questioning its width, uh, uh, become kind of uh, almost like a, bringing in science, obviously, knowledge, bringing in technological tools, fabrication tools, pure design innovations of kind of manipulating the material and discovering the material along the way become also ways and means that we push that traditional material that is usually typically locally tied into perhaps post-territorially grounded, right? So I think in the case of Elias, for instance, what's really interesting is that the, the impossibility of building an area C, yet you are using the stone of area C, right? Or of that geography. So it's built outside that territory and then it's brought, brought back in, right? Or the idea of somehow finding a balance between China and, and or com common ground between China and Canada, right? Because Earth is everywhere, right? So around Earth, although it is different in terms of clay composition, it needs to be rethought in every context, yet there is kind of universality to it that you're able to capitalize on. Or maybe in, in your case, uh, Francisco, when you went to France, I'm assuming, uh, the way you describe it, and then that invasive wood, which is typically had been looked at as a problematic uh, uh, tree type, right? Like, uh, that kind of takes over and somewhat has a lot of environmental impact, kind of accepting that as a material that could be subverted and used because it has this short life cycle, right? 
so I think these are some of the, uh, uh, I think, characteristics that I see across those projects. The other one would be the scale, the question of scale, and maybe this is where maybe we can open up the conversation further, is that all the projects have like, really careful understanding of proportion and size. I think, yes, you always describe your project in metrics, eight meters span, five meters tall, eight square foot. You describe your project uh, uh, in terms of thickness. Uh, of that, uh, it's the wall, sec uh, it's the, uh, the thickness of the wall, right? It's the wall section detail that becomes your kind of space of, uh, of research and innovation. And I think, uh, in a way, uh, Francisco, in your, in your work, when you go to the scale of the bee all the way to the scale of the tree, right? I mean, there's kind of spectrum of scales that you are very much aware of when you produce those spaces. The other thing that is also common among, um, I think, at least both of you guys, is that you were both worked as contractors first, or you accepted contracting as part of your, uh, of your uh, 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 mandate, let's say, be before becoming architect or while becoming architect, right? Um, so having said that, I was wondering if you can reflect on this idea of, so we are beyond this locality and globality because you're all operating locally, but somehow it's post-territorial, and if this, becomes the way of kind of pushing back against the project of modernity that only propagated universalism and typology that could travel across cultures and geographies and climate and be implanted, right? And it performs the same because it's air conditioned or, or because it has the scientific qualities that kind of protects it from the weather uh, as opposed to being integrated with the environment. So I, I was wondering if this is perhaps, if you see this is the future of architecture where there are these look innovation on the local level, yet they could be applicable elsewhere, which could become important for us if, as we face the climate crisis, that the multiplying effect of those solution to be effective on a larger scale, it needs to perhaps to do that. Maybe, maybe I'll take a first crack and then. So the, the question of scale uh, that you touch upon has been, has been uh, the center part of at least our work. Um, and especially, you know, I'm Canadian. I grew up in an environment where there were no people. Uh, and then I moved to China and it's an environment of people. There's people absolutely everywhere. And some of the ideas I had for who I would be building for, uh, some of the sort of more type pavilion work that we were working on. And then you come into China and say, like, okay, I've got problems to solve for a few billion people. That's not quite the scale I was originally thinking about. Right? So, so this sort of blow, blow your brain out um, to what you studied and then what you're gonna be applying it to and multiply it by 20,000 uh, really challenges everything you ever learned uh, about scale, um, how you're going to build, uh, what, te what technologies you choose, especially when we were looking at rammed earth, you know, we, of course we're asking ourselves, uh, for example, in our case, this is cute, but can I build a 30-story building that houses several hundred people uh, it, out of rammed earth? Um, the same way people are looking now at wood and CLT and, and building towers uh, this way too. So. I'm just taking a step back to kind of stretch the definition of scale uh, from, yeah, the scale of the, the materiality, but the scale of the impact and the people that we're trying to build for uh, today. Um, and I think, I think part of it is, is more than anything, it's, and I'm jumping around a little bit, but is always um, some kind of clarity on what's being pursued as mentioned, right, and not being afraid to change course in order to 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 solve a core issue that uh, that that people are after, and becoming really good at something, like understanding something really really well. And I think that's something that's blown me away from the presentations today, right? I'm um, trying to figure out how the heck you carve the stone in that particular way and, and all the materiality work you've done because without question the way we're going to be building, you know, I spend a lot of time in tech in data right now and artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on and I'm looking of course at how we're going to be building with 3D printers in the future and 
how we're going to be using uh, artificial intelligence to, to build the algorithms that are going to be building a lot more organic shapes um, that are responsive to climate, responsive to different types of stresses. And with tools that don't yet exist, but you're all going to be building with and designing with in the next, uh, in the next 10 years. And the, 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 the pattern at which we do that, or the design process, that remains, right? Uh, and so I'm jumping around a little bit, sort of trying to try answer your question, because it's, it's a broad one, but also trying to put it in, in the, the context of the own things that we prioritize, which is scale, uh, impact uh, at scale. And, uh, and you know, I, the scale of what we're doing, for example, is so completely different, but at the same time, so similar. It's about, in my mind, developing an expertise in making sure you understand what you do incredibly well, uh, and then figuring out um, how you how you can take it to uh, to to scale um, thereafter. And scale might not be uh, bigness of you know I'm not going to build uh, a 30-story tower out of let's say blocks, but I might use that to impact, as you're so well describing, an economy mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, Doing, doing more than... than uh, so, so measuring the scale is important. Yes, yeah. So a bit of a ramble there, but I was trying to, trying to answer a very uh, open question. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, recently I came across, da you know David Harvey? He's a professor at the London School of Economics. And he was describing so well that the last, the, the greatest crisis of our times, they were all solved by the building sector. I mean, from Roosevelt, 1929, you know, oil crisis in the 80s, um, post-war, and even the crisis now in 2008, it was, I mean, if you could point one thing, that was the building sector. It was, you know, when China decided to make the high-speed connection between Beijing and Hong Kong, that was like the beginning of the end of the of the crisis. So, and um, as uh, David was saying at the opening of the of this series, um, the impact of the building sector in the environment, biodiversity, uh, landfill is just huge. It's colossal. So we're the elites, um, and I say, I say it without any arrogance. Architecture is perhaps the only discipline that is able to connect technology and cultural w awareness uh, in such a significant way as we, as, as we are now to tackle the crisis we have at hand. You know? Who else could connect water security to food uh, supply, to, uh, to the, the whole material production manufacturing sector from extraction, from trans you know, and, and all the, the building, the footprint of buildings, who can, who can else articulate all of this except architects? So, um, yes, the materials and the building materials you use for making buildings is very, very significant is very, very significant. So anything you do in terms of, um, of uh, offsetting or f creating loops of positive feedbacks into your local, regional um, uh, environment, uh, if you do it with architecture, is always at a grand scale. Remember, some palaces, some buildings, they take up whole forests, you know? 80,000, 100,000 trees in one single building. I mean, these are numbers we should really reflect upon and uh, not worry so much, I mean, of the sheer scale of your building. That's not as relevant as, for instance, supporting a company, a building company, that once you work with them, they will be able to replicate the technique into some other dozens and dozens of buildings. I mean, this is architecture. It's a lot more than what you see um, um, uh, I mean, what you see is important in the terms in terms 
uh, of how it connects what you don't see. But that's all. Because the impact is invisible. I think uh, referring to the question of scale and uh, what you noticed, uh, I mean, concerning my presentation, that I always mentioned the proportions, the height, the span, etc., is to emphasize the fact that even uh, the evolution of the material of stone during the last 50 years has uh, pushed stone to become only a kind of decorative uh, cladding material that's used to hide concrete structures. Uh, and the idea is to, to say that basically looking at the new technologies that are uh, open today, how we can push uh, further on the, um, the static possibilities of the material to push it at, at its limits, and how uh, going from a micro scale, how uh, the impact of the technique could have an influence on the city, and how basically the, um, the, uh, the, the techniques of construction would impact uh, you know, urban setups. Um, and as well, the scale would reflect uh, the idea of being global and local and trying to hinge and uh, connect different uh, elements of architecture that could uh, you know, be inspired by different areas and how, how they can come into correlation. So, uh, I mean, it's, um, we just noticed that the entire, I mean, the Middle East in general, the historic Middle East in general is constructed, is craft, is, are crafted cities and uh, they resulted into morphologies that are quite adapted to the climates, to the different uh, ways of using space. While today it's uh, more an arch architecture of objects and an architecture of investors. So basically, yeah, this is what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think I will pass it to you. I just want to say, I think, uh, I think your answer is really kind of uh, resonate with, with your presentation, obviously, and with what I had in mind when I asked the question is that I think what you describe as making the invisible visible, in this case, material is not about fetishizing the objectness of it, but actually what it could communicate to us in terms of processes of making and making either kind of political history that you guys talk about or the economy and the craftsmanship uh, that, that you guys were talking about. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we want to open it up for a couple of questions before we um, take a break and move on to the next panel. So if any of you in the audience have a question, get it, get it ready. Um, but I will um, just build off of that a little bit by asking one, one question before, before I go to you. Thanks, thanks for raising your hand. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's fitting that, that we're addressing not only scale in terms of like the multiple scales, but um, magnitude of impact yeah. um, and how each of you in your own way is in, engaging that. Um, but at the same time, I want to really note that the work that you presented um, you know, was striking and raw and powerful with a compelling aesthetic. Um, and so my question is, I mean, something that I am I'm wondering about myself increasingly and working with my students on and some of them in this room is um, how do you advocate for things like beauty and quality of space and aesthetics um, as well as for things like fair labor practices and social equality uh, in the context of climate change. I mean, in the, in the context of what we almost didn't state yet today. I mean, I, I think Andres covered it a little bit in the introduction, but you know, that, you know, according to all intelligent measures, we have 11 years to radically um, transform everything about our lives and certainly about our um, carbon emissions or we will trigger this irreversible catastrophic change. So in other words, like, Although it's cliche, I, I, I think at a certain point we cannot care if it's cliche that like there may be this, this crisis and call to action that we've never before had in potentially human history. So can we still advocate for design or what is the role of design? That's partly why I put the provocation originally of Paolo Antonelli saying like, we are doomed, but we can design a, you know, a dignified <laughs> path to our doomed fate. But I wonder in your own work, how do you, you know, the work, in other words, the work comes across as, as beautiful, as design. Um, but do you advocate for that? Can we 
Um, how, how do you balance that with the, with the other stakes at hand? When people ask, like, what's, what's beauty, then you, I tend to ask who's asking, you know? Because design and beauty, it's, it's, um, it's something so, I mean, beauty is one thing, design is other thing. Uh, and sometimes we maybe confuse both, as I was about to do. But uh, what I try to design is, um, is, is invisible uh, networks and relations between nature and people and local craftsmen and and CO2 footprints etc and and that's basically the design work we do is about that like 90% of our energies is setting relations and getting people in place and all that and then something will come across <laughs> something will happen and uh, we ha I mean I at least I have the conviction myself that 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 this something that happens is a reflection of a good work. So somehow I tend to think that beauty is, 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 is an express, uh, expression of goodness. So some, somehow, I mean, if there's an effort to do something that is, uh, um, that is, um, um, that is honest work and um, that you work hard for something that is not for your own self but somehow for the common good, that somehow that will carry some beauty in it. You don't need to design beauty, basically. It's uh, something that emerges, emerges out of your service to otherness, somehow. Um, oof. Uh, I have a really good friend who's a chemist. And, uh, well, not a really good friend. He's a good acquaintance who is a chemist. Um, and uh, he says the only person he, uh, the only type of people he ever wants to work with are architects, because they're the only optimists left in the planet. Uh, and uh, I thought that was uh, kind of very true. Um, and if you if you take uh, the the path of the provocation that you set, uh, which is which is a valid um, argument, the there's no question that we're going to hit a wall. The question is at what speed we're going to hit the wall, and whether uh, there's and, and sort of what what gets planned in consequence, right? Um, and there's a certain percentage of the population out there um, who's, who have an apt for inspiring others. Uh, and whenever there's a, sort of a disaster at hand, it's the first set of people that step up and start to inspire uh, what gets built uh, thereafter. Um, that's our role. That's, uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we're trained for. Um, so if I know today that I uh, am gonna hit a wall, then I'm gonna design an airbag. That's just my job, right? Uh, and because my job is to inspire others, I'm gonna make that airbag really damn beautiful. Uh, because in architecture school, one of the things that, that happened when I w was uh, going through architecture school was that there was too much thinking, and that drove me nuts. Um, I did not like architecture school. Uh, there would, without, I had to step back out and, and do construction and, and be in the design office. I just I needed to sort of have a balance between the the theoretical um, and uh, and the practical, um, just to uh, just have a chance to uh, you know put things put things back into physicality and uh, and sort of practice the art of uh, of um, of. Uh, Making things uh, making things uh, beautiful um, in order to 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 inspire, but I I really think that uh, you know that that uh, ultimately will be and is our uh, our fundamental role um, as a, as a profession and the type of people it uh, it attracts uh, is to always be looking at the the solutions because there there will always be um, one. It's just a question again, repeating myself uh, on. Um, Taking, taking the provocation, if we are gonna hit the wall, at what speed, and what do we design uh, in, uh, in consequence. But, uh, yeah, the, sorry, the, the, I lost my thought there because I'm jet lagged and very, very tired. Um, but the, the one piece I, I wanted to say um, was that uh, there's a lot of rational thinking that happens in, in school, which is great, and there's a lot of process. Um, 
but we need to we need to trust our gut and our emotions a lot more. Um, the only way to do that is through practice, which is which is why I was mentioning the need to get uh, the hands dirty because we tend to think of ourselves as rational beings with the ability to have, or rational beings um, with the ability to feel emotions, that's a complete load of crap. We are emotional beings with the ability to rationalize, right? Uh, and so again, being able to leverage that skill, use it for design, and make sure everything we do is beautiful, taps into that fundamental truth that we are first and foremost emotional beings before we rationalize. And so uh, designing for beauty should actually be, in many ways, our number one priority because that is the first thing we respond to, not the way it's been rationalized. I just have uh, to add, I mean, what I have to add uh, spe specifically towards that is that we, uh, we are not supposed to, I mean, the whole process of a, of a project is not inscribed in a, in a perspective where it has to respond to a certain aesthetic or, or a certain beauty, but it's the whole uh, chain or maybe the whole context in which we operate and how we put together these different aspects of a project. Uh, for example, I mean, obviously these project that projects that are based on stereotomy and on the art of cutting stones and how we can generate structures that are totally self-standing is inscribed in a, in a very technical approach, but the fact that we are trying to couple the, the uh, know-how of local makers and local techniques and artisans with, um, with uh, advanced mechanisms and advanced technology allows to, um, to, have to generate a sort of capacity to bring together a certain aesthetic to uh, uh, inst a very contextual inserted uh, form of architecture. Um, thank you so much for sharing your vision and your uh, inspiring experience from your practice. There's one question I want to ask specifically to Mr. Uh, Vallis. Like when you made your decision to move from Canada to China, was there like um, anything, like any special quality within that market or that culture that sort of driven this decision or like a problem or issue you saw there? Because like, uh, I know more than half of the concrete is actually poured in the land of China every year, and we feel desperate about it. It was like, like one of the issue that driven your decision. Uh, yeah, it was. It's a good question. Thanks for asking. It is one liner. I mean, I'm I'm from Quebec, uh, which is a place with no people, um, and uh, uh, where problems you don't feel, um, global problems you just really don't feel uh, there compared. So when I graduated, it was just, what's the busiest place on earth? Where's the largest opportunity to have an impact? Uh, the busiest place was Shanghai at the time. So I bought myself a one-way ticket and moved to Shanghai. Uh, so if it had been, I always joke, if it had been Brazil, I'd be in Brazil. Uh, there, I happen to love Asia, uh, that helps. Um, fell in love even more uh, once there. So there's a lot of qualities there for sure. But it was really just the opportunity for uh, for impact, and uh, we don't live very long. You know, most people are master architects by the time they're 50 or 55. I don't have that patience, uh, and they're master architects because by that time they've built 120 projects. I wanted to build 120 projects by the time I was 30, um, and I did. Uh, and so it was really just looking for the opportunity to get the hands dirty, learn as much as possible, as quickly as possible because I'm not going to be alive very long, and there's a lot of work to do. Hi, thank you. This is a question for any and all of you, but in response to something that Rafer said at the very beginning about needing to convince rich people that these materials were beautiful, and I'm wondering if you flipped that question um, talking about the need to also convince people who aren't affluent, who are low income, that these materials might be valuable and worth building with because I think there is still a very real stigma in a lot of parts of the world that um, rammed earth and mud brick and a lot of these natural building materials are no longer preferable and you see people also unlearning a lot of these traditional crafts um, and building techniques because of that and I'm wondering if you've experienced 
this type of stigma in any of the work that, that you've done um, around these materials? Uh, yeah, of course, I mean, uh, you know, because it's, uh, I mean, I think these, uh, we have in common that all these projects are based on uh, more research-based projects. They're uh, still under, you know, kind of um, um, trying to find ways actually to push the scale of these structures towards, uh, to have really an impact on the city. Um, for example, I mean, in the context of what we do in terms of stone, um, as I mentioned during my presentation, stone has been used historically as a structural component and gradually it became only a co uh, cover uh, of concrete uh, elements. So um, today the cost of stone is, uh, in the context of how it's being used, is very low because it's only uh, thicknesses of two to three, five centimeters and uh, the fact that we are thinking of using stone as a massive material, it implies that it's bigger chunks of stone. But in, on a longer term basis, we are thinking that these chunks of stone can be readapted and reconfigured in uh, various ways, while when you have only uh, very light uh, elements, then the possibilities and the future expansion is very limited. And there's as well uh, the fact that um, on, uh, on a mid-term or long-term basis, these uh, constructions are more thought of as, uh, as uh, structures that are more responsive and that could have an impact on on the uh, long-term uh, uh, use of the space. Okay. <laughs> well, my my answer is not. I I um, I don't know much about. You know, I try to respond to my environment and to the people around me. And so, um, considerations on the, on on whether you know, it's more to reach people. Everybody pays, plays a role. We know, I mean, the, the rich, the, the, the poor, or the middle, or everybody pay, plays a role. It doesn't have much to do with where they stand. So I rather play with the, with the people around me and the needs of those people, and that's, that's already complex enough, you know? If I go on, like, asking, like, okay, how do I globalize this, or how do I answer the world's questions? I mean, I get paralyzed, <laughs> really. And that's, that's something I uh, yeah. try not to answer <laughs> universal but, questions. And I mean, both in your both work, you, there is a, almost uh, a product that's been, at the end of the day, produced that has the possibility of being marketed and, and uh, reproduced, right? I mean, you yeah. do... You do touch on the, you are at the kind of this threshold of where it could become really sure, exponentially sure. bigger. As a the, 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 key, um, the key is, is um, we are an aspirational animal. Uh, the, that's really the uniqueness of humanity, is that we're born aspirational. Uh, and unlike, I don't know, a frog, maybe frog aspires to something, but uh, no one's ever asked, but I'm not sure. Uh, humans are born aspirational. And so you want to take a material uh, and make it noble. Uh, so, so it's not just, it was, you know, the, it, it has nothing to do in my mind with whether they're, they're rich or poor. The only, the conscious decision on our part to say we're going to work for wealthy clients was because we wanted to do research and we needed somebody to pay for it. Uh, and the uh, idea that, and we were very blunt with our clients about that. It's uh, say, okay, um, your project, we're gonna design this and you're gonna be the guinea pig for this. Uh, and it, what, what, I'm gonna be a guinea pig for what do you wanna research in my project? And he said, this. And, that, and I'm gonna have to pay for it? Yes. And that, well, why would I do that? Because you're benefiting from all the guinea pigs that came before you in our other projects. And uh, like, oh, okay. And then we convince him it was a controlled experiment. Uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna experiment with this very much same scale, right? Convincing somebody to do an arch out of compressed brick that's never been done before, it's, uh, that's what you're gonna be a guinea pig for and we're gonna build a prototype and it's gonna be a controlled experiment and if it fails, we'll do something else. But that, uh, the, that process of, of always having one experimental thing um, that, that creates that aspiration in each project is the really fun part. 
uh, and uh, and guiding clients down that road. And we just we just chose uh, affluent clients because they were able to to, to accelerate the research that uh, that we wanted to do, and then make it available um, to uh, to others thereafter. But I think have them expire to it. There was one more question up here, and then I think Andres can make some closing and transitional remarks because we want to make sure we have enough time for the next panel. So um, I really like the aspirational animal um, reference that you just made, um, but I also really uh, agree with David's uh, timeline of 11 years. And I think that um, when we are sitting here uh, trying to identify what the role of the architect is in the scope of this conversation, um, I think it's also important to realize that there's a lot of value in the exploration of these materials, but there's also a generalized focus on what the potentials of the materials are, but we're not too sensitive about the way that we're doing it. In terms of globalizing these materials for the sake of climate change, I think is very powerful. But also we are limiting the way that it's being done. I feel like we are limiting the potential to truly globalize it in a sense that we are not gonna be able to provide, you know, settlements in, you know, rural settlements in East Africa with a four axis CNC machine because that's what's required to make this material globalized. And I think that that's something that we have to tie into this timeline. To a certain point, we have to explore and understand the possibilities of these materials, but also we have to turn around and look back to see how it is that we're gonna start implementing them. And I think that this, there's this, again, generalized lack of discourse on that, on how these materials are gonna come back and do the role that we're designing them for. And in terms of aesthetic, I think that aesthetic right now is or could be or the potential of aesthetic could be to kind of um, I guess make the material more attractive therefore more marketable um, but again aesthetic isn't really answering the first question which is how do we throw it back into communities It's a, it's a, that's an awesome closing comment, uh, actually. Thanks okay. for, thanks mm -hmm. for posing that. Um, I wanted to add to that if I can, despite being over time. Uh, the, uh, one of the things that we hit upon in, in Rammed Earth a lot is we get a lot of inquiries from uh, well-intentioned people who say, ooh, I'm really interested in Rammed Earth. It's kind of like a DIY thing. Uh, and then we step back and no, 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 this is not a DIY thing. Uh, this is a human health and safety thing. Um, and a lot of the research being done now on those, the basic materials that might provide shelter in the future or the now, uh, have a really hugely missing engineering component uh, to them. And uh, you know, so that we're not, uh, if we are trying to do this uh, at scale, um, that uh, some of the, the core design and engineering thinking goes back uh, into them. Um, and that's in, in, in our own field, uh, the rammed earth field, uh, we see a lot of very dangerous good intentions uh, for people who are uh, DIYing materials without having any understanding of the engineering and human health and safety implications uh, behind it from seismic uh, implications and, and weather wearing and, and so on. So extracting that knowledge uh, to take uh, very local materials and do them in a properly uh, engineered way that will actually help people as opposed to harm them uh, are some of the sort of key simple lessons that can and should be pulled uh, out of these experiments to be able to help uh, solve some of these issues at, at, at large scale. Andres is yeah. ceding his time to his own next panel. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to make I, No, I think I would I think we're out of time. I really, uh, I also appreciate that comment and I agree with you. It's, it's, there's a risk when you go and become the marketing part as it becomes uh, desirable that material because it has the green qualification that it complies with. We talked about a little bit before the uh, lecture start is that the access this doesn't guarantee the availability of the material and its performance doesn't guarantee its accessibility to places where you really want it to be. And it also doesn't guarantee the equal distribution where that material needs to be. So there's kind of an, another conversation, perhaps, that needs to be taken on after that. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you all for a great presentation.